Truth Espresso, episode 186. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hey there, this is Daniel Minnick, the host for Truth Espresso, along with my sweet, beautiful wife and co-host, Chelsea Minnick. And we are going to talk about some of the latest news related to the fallout, the reactions with the Dobbs versus Jackson case, the overturning of Roe versus Wade, because the drama with that continues on. And <laughs> and boy, has it happened. I know, you know, unfortunately, we've seen the Jane's Revenge and stuff groups commit more violence against uh, pregnancy centers and churches after the ruling, but social media also has its way of uh, reactions, especially TikTok users. <laughs> You're ready to talk about some of this and what it means for those of us who want to get the message of the truth about abortion and about what the pro-life position is really about. Um, you ready to talk about that, sweetheart? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mentioned TikTok now, just for the record, as of this recording and probably for the foreseeable future, I have never been on TikTok. <laughs> I don't have a TikTok account. I don't know what TikTok looks like. Other than someone showing, you know, a short video that they did on TikTok. But <laughs> other than that, I know nothing about TikTok. So this is only from research and reading about kind of transcripts of what people said in TikTok videos. Yes, thank you for not having a TikTok account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's some I, crazy stuff on there. So. Yeah, I've heard that it's a haven for transgenderism and doctrination and stuff like that. So especially for young kids. So just kind of an aside there for parents, don't just let your kids have a TikTok account and their private phone and tablet because they surely would end up meeting people and being pushed into things like transgender. But <laughs> I have this crazy statistic that I saw from Answers in Genesis that kids ages four years old mm. to 15 years old spend over an hour a day on TikTok. Yikes. <laughs> That's young. And I mean, the TikTok videos, I think they have to be less than a minute, maybe. Well, they're short, so spending over an hour is a indicator that the kids are watching a lot mm, or getting yeah. a lot of information yeah. in that amount of time. And one of the most common hashtag videos that they saw was the hashtag trans. Mm. It was seen over 26 billion times. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> it's just crazy. So, yeah. yes. so definitely, aware. yeah, definitely advice to parents, especially monitor, supervise your children's access to the Internet, especially if they had <laughs> anything to do with something like TikTok. <laughs> and so what's the trend on TikTok now with the <laughs> Roe v. Wade? Yeah. So that's what we're going to get into. Some of the fallout from the decision there overturning Roe versus Wade and there's an article that I looked at from Insider.com by a Y's Yip uh, entitled Women on TikTok Say Hookup Culture Will Be Absolutely Decimated If Roe v. Wade Is Overturned. So this was back before the decision, after the leak, and this was from May 4th, 2022. So basically on the day that the decision was leaked, it's kind of like the similar fallout to when the decision actually happened. There was a young woman who, in the video, said, quote, In case you're a man who doesn't care about Roe v. Wade, just know that if abortion gets banned, hookup culture will be absolutely decimated. And so she's assuming that 
pro-life, <laughs> the pro-life position is almost entirely a man's thing. It's a position that most men take, or it just naturally flows out of men, because somehow it's like a cultural thing, it's a misogynistic thing, that most men don't like abortions, but somehow they couple that with the idea that most men like hookup culture. Now, today it seems that a lot of men are addicted to hookup culture just as much as, if I haven't looked at, to see if it's more, but probably so, I wouldn't doubt it, that a lot of men rely on hookup culture just like women do. But this young woman is warning men, allegedly pro-life men, allegedly men who don't care or would prefer to see Roe v. Wade overturned, which happened, that hookup culture would be decimated and the idea is that these men think that nothing would happen to them somehow if Roe v. Wade was overturned. Like, they can have their hookup culture... You know, nothing changes about them. All that changes is that things happen to women and they don't care. They're misogynistic. They just want to control women. I think the same woman in the video also said, quote, What woman would have mediocre, uh, I'll use the word relationship here, with a drunk rando if he could potentially father their child? <laughs> and uh, the video was addressed to, quote, all the pro-life men who love Plan B, unquote. <laughs> so, sweetheart, you have done a lot of stuff for the pro-life cause. You've had conversations. You volunteered at pregnancy resource centers since you were like a teenager, right? <laughs> yes. um, you've done protests, sidewalk counseling, you've done ultrasounds and stuff like that. So you have been in the throes of this pro-life movement. So are there a lot of pro-life men who like Plan B? Is that a typical description? Is most pro-life people involved in the movement men and do they like Plan B? <laughs> I'm assuming plan B is the morning after pill and stuff like that. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> well, that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are some, but I don't know if it's a description apropos of the pro-life movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Plan B is controversial mm. among people in the pro-life movement and among Christians mm. because some people say, well, you're taking the pill before you would even know you're pregnant, so there's a chance that you're preventing the actual fertilization process and others say, okay, you don't know exactly when the fertilization process took place, so you are causing an abortion early on. So yeah, there's some controversy with that part, just even among the pro-life. So I think that saying that all pro-life men like that is definitely misinformation on their part of it. And then I think it was interesting reading, and this is my pop question for you. <laughs> okay. So. Another question that, so this shows that not everything about our episode is scripted or rehearsed or what, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> when Chelsea says pop quiz or question and stuff, <laughs> I have no idea what it is, so I'll do my best to answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> the question for today is... <laughs> Today's secret word is... No, <laughs> Statistically, mm. do you think that men or women, so we're looking at ages 15 to 19 years old, do you think more men or more women are active? <laughs> more men or more women? Mm -hmm. Like, is it lean more toward men or, more, or toward women? Mm -hmm. Or do you mean like over time... Okay, so from the the study is done from it's reported by the CDC, okay. which we have to take that with a grain of salt, of course. But the years two thousand fifteen to two thousand seventeen. Okay. And then it's among aged fifteen to nineteen. Okay, and the question was: Is it more men or more women? Correct. So. Um, from <laughs> the way I would assume, and I could be wrong, is that it's more men. <laughs> Right? That's what I would think, too. Okay. Okay. 
But their data shows 42% of females and 38% of males. Mm, Okay. So my assumptions weren't correct then. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But kind of what I'm thinking, though, is that this actually shows on, I was reading an article about this, too. I don't remember exactly where, but and I want to read more of it later, too. It was just talking about how our culture has become so focused on women Mm. having such this desire to be intimate Mm. that they're kind of putting a lot more pressure and more women are becoming more active in that way because that's kind of what culture is pushing on them. Mm, And it's kind of frustrating (laughs) because you look in the Bible, it's like, okay, it shouldn't be this one woman or man, like one or the other. It has to be this consensual, mutual Mm, thing (laughs) between the man and woman. And God made men and women different. Mm -hmm. So our desires, our needs, our responses, of course, those are going to be different. Mm. And they can be different for each couple, for each person. Oh, yes, for sure. (laughs) But I think overall, the influence that we have with trying to make women so equal with men that we're trying to even push this, like, women have such a high intimacy need and desire Mm. and yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just getting pushed so much. I think that that could be part of where those statistics are coming in as well. Mm. Yeah, exactly. As you said, the push for equality per se, like equality can have different meanings, you know, Mm -hmm. equality does not have to mean the same, you know, because they want to say, okay, men and women are in most respects, the same thing, you know, rather than like, okay, different, but equal, you know, they want to say the same and equal, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of thing. So it's like, well, good job on the pop question because <laughs> I would have guessed the same oh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an easy assumption to make, but wow, how things have changed there with the political push. And yeah, so that's why you seem to have all these uh, women, especially with TikTok, becoming a very, you know, one of the most popular social media platforms. And all the fallout from Roe v. Wade, and it seems like a lot of these women now have this need in their mind that we must have guaranteed full access to abortion to function, you know. Abortion pretty much, you know, has become a form of birth control for the latter, you know, of the 50 years that Roe has been, as is called, the law of the land, you know, even though it's not law, it was never law, it was a case (laughs) ruling, but the idea that Roe restricted what states could do and abortion was guaranteed to some extent in pregnancy to be available and could not be banned in any of the states. It was always available to everyone anywhere they can get to a clinic. So then culture seemed to have shifted from the old abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. And no one is truly pro-abortion. Everyone, you know, can be called pro-life. It's just your approach. And uh, abortion should be legal to make sure that there are fewer abortions. You know, I've heard those arguments too. Like if you make abortion illegal, then you get more abortions. So it's kind of a balancing act that everyone wants to reduce abortions. And how you go about that is to make it legal and rare and stuff. And then in the last decade, it seems, things have shifted over to like, wait, we shouldn't be apologizing for this. We shouldn't feel bad about it. This isn't a tragedy. This isn't an unfortunate solution. Shout your abortion because now abortion has become a fundamental right, as we've been (laughs) told now, you know, with the reversal of Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court is now politically activist misogynistic, um, denying women a fundamental right. Yeah, so abortion is a fundamental right, and it's a fundamental right because it promotes, as we said, equality between men and women. 
So what exactly is that? That seems to be what we're talking about here. It seems to be what these women are talking about here. And their understanding of what is often called hookup culture. (laughs) Don't you think that's sad to see that women believe this deception that I mean, basically, woman equals the right to choose when to be pregnant or when to not be pregnant. And if you don't want to be pregnant right there, then you have an abortion. But God was so clear in when he made Adam and Eve that he told both man and woman, hmm. be fruitful yeah. and multiply. Yes. It wasn't <laughs> this, oh, if it's a good time or, oh, if you're in a committed married relationship or, oh, if your baby doesn't have this problem. It was just simple and said to both of them, <laughs> be fruitful and multiply. And yeah. now we've just gone so far away from that and we've convoluted how God created our mm. family structure yeah. <laughs> and our system. And I think to me, like sometimes it's like one of those <laughs> things where you get frustrated, but at the same time, like you're kind of grieved that yeah. <laughs> we believe these lies so easily and these women and these men out there are following the deception and we know like, okay, this is what Satan wants because he's the father of deceit and yeah. lies. And- uh, yeah, the father of lies and whereas God creates life, Satan relishes in death and that's what yeah, this has become because now, you know, with the recent, was it the Georgia Guidestones that revealed kind of like similar to the humanist manifesto before the idea of reduce the population because I've also heard of abortion being like a moral good kind of like to save the planet too like to yeah Yeah. abortion is necessary to prevent overpopulation and starving the earth of resources and prevent climate change and stuff like that so yeah how things have changed (laughs) oh and abortion is beneficial because you can do experiments on the baby body parts oh, yeah. <laughs> of the abortion. Yeah, that part's just sickening to the, the stomach. But <laughs> yeah, so we've definitely gone away from, like you mentioned, that abortion was rare, safe, and legal. <laughs> now it's any and all is your right. Yeah, and yeah, it's like it's now a sacrament, <laughs> yes. the sacrament of abortion. <laughs> But what's interesting <laughs> is how how some of these TikTok women or social media women are dealing with the possible changes to culture. So we mentioned hookup culture would be decimated. One of the recent trending hashtags is hashtag abstinence. <laughs> so basically the cry is like, Hey, men, assuming men equals pro-lifers, if you don't support women's rights, parentheses abortion, (laughs) then I'm practicing abstinence. And yeah, so there's the idea of like, we need to go on a strike. No relations with men, not even your husbands, unless you're intending to get pregnant. So, yeah, there's some problems with that, but it's irony here because the idea is that they're punishing men for getting rid of women's rights. Now, what are some of the problems with this understanding of pro-life, do you think, sweetheart? (laughs) Like, is this an accurate understanding? Like, okay, let's practice abstinence to punish these men (laughs) for overturning Roe v. Wade. And yeah. <laughs> well, this is what we've been saying all along. Uh, yeah. <laughs> from like, the pro life standpoint. <laughs> like, so, you mean the pro life position isn't a part of hookup culture? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like the other side of the coin of hookup culture. <laughs> no, I think pro life, the word means that you're for life. And when you're practicing abstinence before you're married, and then you know that when you are intimate, that there's a possibility of bringing forth life. And that's how God made us. 
then you are being for life and the hookup culture is not for life. They're just for their own selfish gain and desires and ultimately they support pro-death options to be able to continue with that lifestyle. Yeah, definitely, sweetheart. So it seems like some of the problems with this as it misunderstands pro-life is number one pro-life is mostly men now (laughs) as you have volunteered and been active of course i'm talking to you you're a woman so you are (laughs) um, as you've been active in pro-life campaigns and stuff is it mostly men or is there a you know a decent balance there like say 50 50 and stuff like that (laughs) um i would say it's mostly women but a lot of times there's their husbands or other people that support them in it but Mm -hmm. i mean more active in Mm -hmm. pro-life ministries and such there is definitely a higher number of women in it (laughs) yeah and i mean i'm sure men and women probably do different things in pro-life you know so the men are probably more of the often the debaters the presenters and stuff like that women are more of the relationship the counseling and stuff now you volunteered in crisis pregnancy centers or what are they're now called pregnancy resource centers do a lot of men work there or is it mostly women (laughs) <laughs> You're so cute. You keep I'm asking really, this with a smile. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because, yeah. I mean, I visited crisis pregnancy center and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like it's mostly women, yeah. but that makes sense because oh, yeah. it's women coming there for like information or resources about women's stuff. <laughs> yeah, like women know women's needs and stuff. And yeah. so the best people to deal with crisis pregnancy situations, women come in for that and women are there to help. And these pregnancy resource centers are created by, staffed by, run by women. <laughs> there might be some men who donate and stuff like that or guest speak at events and stuff like that. But this is a woman owned controlled you know (laughs) organized part of the pro-life movement (laughs) although i say that most centers they see like how important men are in Mm. being a part of that because when you have a woman that comes in in a pregnancy and she's feeling overwhelmed and okay she had a man in her life or has one in her life to be in this pregnant state And they are finding, like, it's just important for men to come and mentor those boyfriends or husbands or just kind of helping the men alongside the girl. So I think that, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of times and maybe earlier on in the pregnancy centers that it was like so focused on women Mm -hmm. that it was like, okay, but what about the men? Mm -hmm. Because they need encouraged, they need mentoring, they need to learn how to stand up and be a supportive husband and a good dad and Mm -hmm. take care of his family. So there are a lot of centers now that do have like making sure that they have men available to come and support them as well. So yeah, <laughs> just a little plug in for that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So you are the yeah. Uh, thank you for making that clear there. And so the like the point is that I think it seems like there's a lot of misunderstanding going on here recently about the pro-life movement and who constitutes it like it's men and women pretty much equally i'd say with them doing different things but when it comes to pregnancy resource centers which seem to be a face of pro-life especially the ones that are getting attacks and vandalism and stuff like that since the leak of the draft of uh, dobbs versus jackson decision and these are things mostly run by women and so like, okay, these radical pro-abortion groups are harming women in the process of protesting <laughs> the overturn of Roe versus Wade here. But so misunderstanding number one, pro-life equals men. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if men want to overturn Roe v. Wade, and then a misunderstanding number two seems to be that 
the pro-lifers who want to overturn Roe versus Wade, meaning men, seem to be also involved in hookup culture. <laughs> you know, so it seems to be the idea that everyone does hookup culture and pro-lifers equals men who are misogynistic because the reason they don't like abortions is that it liberates women to be equal with men, as we mentioned before, you know, equal with men, the same as men, and that, okay, well, if this tool of pregnancy for misogynistic men is to control women to make sure women are put in their place and so i know i was reading <laughs> some articles from pro-abortion women saying that men assuming pro-life men they don't realize what this does to them if roe versus wade gets overturned because they're gonna suffer if hookup culture gets decimated they like plan B and they get to walk away from relationships, but they don't want women to have that ability. And abortion is key for women having the right to walk away from relationships like men do. But wait a minute, you know, as we said, pro-life is not hookup culture. I think pro-life is against hookup culture and pro-life men are not about impregnating women so they could walk away. <laughs> I think pro-life encompasses the idea of believing the Word of God and believing what the Word of God says about the importance of marriage and family, not hookup culture. <laughs> and at what point does it become like a choice for the woman versus that it's actually a forced relationship or what we would call rape? Because, I mean, at some point, the woman should be able to say, no, I don't want to, or no, I can't. Like, <laughs> I mean, I talk to a lot of women about natural family planning and tracking their cycles. And you can know by certain symptoms when you're going to be fertile and when you could become pregnant. <laughs> and so you just say, like, if you don't want to be pregnant at that time, like, no, we're not going to do it at this time. And I mean, yeah. <laughs> in most Christian families, it should be like respectable to consider if the wife says mm. no, that that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so. it always needs to be that consensual thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yet these pro-abortion women are making it sound like every single case is almost like the case of rape because they have no ability to say no to the man. It just seems like it's always forced in their yeah, position so. because you can't get pregnant every single day. Yeah. Otherwise. And, and it seems like pro-abortion politicians uh, consider any undesired pregnancy, even if the relationship part was intentional, if they happen to get pregnant and they don't want it, that's forced pregnancy. And they can even call that rape, like in the case of uh, a recent speech that AOC did, you know, she claimed that she was raped, but basically it was the idea that, you know, she and some guy, you know, she said that I was like, 22 or 23 years old but you think okay if you experience that traumatic thing you would know when it happened you know <laughs> otherwise it kind of raises some suspicions there but there's no record or anything like that of reporting of rape you know it's like okay it's just the term is applied to a casual hookup culture where the guy didn't want to stick around you know <laughs> and okay we can call that rape and still stuff like that but <laughs> but hashtag abstinence so here's misunderstanding number three you know that abstinence punishes pro-lifers <laughs> so it's like you pro-lifer men who wanted to overturn roe versus wade if you don't support women's rights parentheses abortion then I'm going to punish you with abstinence. And so, yeah. <laughs> Can you help me to understand this, sweetheart? <laughs> like, <laughs> does, isn't abstinence something that pro-lifers believe in? And yeah, so does this really punish pro-life men? Or would it punish 
pro-abortion men. <laughs> they have more, I think. Yes, this is definitely a huge misunderstanding because I think, I mean, like you said, pro-life men respect women, they value women, and they want to protect women and try and stay abstinent until they're committed in their marriage relationship. <laughs> and Wait, what's that? <laughs> you know, you hear all the talk about stuff like, I don't see the word marriage or anything showing up here. Like, I think it's a lost art, <laughs> you know, the lost art of marriage. You know, it's like we've yeah. forgotten that that word's in the dictionary, that there's a meaning to it. And that, it, you know, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, this whole argument is just another way of showing how disconnected the pro-abortion mm. people are in that okay we've been trying to talk to them about abstinence for a long time and i know i talked to you about this the other night too babe but when i was working at the pregnancy centers and we'd go to high schools or colleges and the majority of the kids want to practice abstinence or they are practicing abstinence and only a few were not. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting yeah. because most people thought that everyone was in an intimate relationship. And then when you expose like, okay, not everyone is, and most people don't want to be, and then they see like, oh, okay, I feel like I'm not the Lone Ranger here. <laughs> and oh, yeah. It just helps them understand that. But I mean, we've been trying to teach kids that because we believe that women are valuable. We believe that men are valuable. And when you practice abstinence, you're saying that I care about you and I love you so much that I'm going to wait until I'm in a committed marriage relationship mm. to share that part of intimacy yes. with you. <laughs> and that's what God designed. That's yes. what he says in his word, because there's something beautiful about it. And there's something that is just protective about it in all rounds. You don't have the risk for sexually transmitted infections. You don't have the risk of pregnancy outside of marriage. You don't have the risk of multiple relationships or abusive relationships. I mean, not saying that marriage protects all of that, but it definitely decreases that when you follow God's plan for relationships, abstinence, and marriage. <laughs> Sorry, that was kind of a long answer. Oh, no, that's definitely helpful. So you are, because it explains, as I said, what we've been wanting to say to pro-abortion people, like, this is what we're all about. You know, We're not about forcing pregnancies on women and abandoning them. You know, we want to care for women. And we want to help them, help people, help pro-abortionists to understand what the pro-life position really is about and that it is about the idea of valuing other people so much that you save yourself for marriage and that there's a loving bond of marriage there and that pregnancy is a mutual thing, you know. <laughs> pregnancy happens because you know as they talk about choice well this is how choice should be put into action here by you choose to get pregnant because you know you save yourself you get married and then you know that's god's design for pregnancy is husband and wife having children starting a family <laughs> Ever wish you could get together with a friend over coffee each week and talk about God's Word? Me too. Hi, I'm Anthony Russo. I'm the host of Grace and Peace Radio. Grace and Peace Radio is a Christian living blog and podcast dedicated to engaging conversations about applying God's Word to everyday life. I hope you'll join me, Anthony Russo, on Grace and Peace Radio each week at graceandpeaceradio.com or right here on the Christian Podcast Community.org. Don't you think that women, like these pro-abortion women, my heart goes out to them oh, so yeah. much because they act as if they are nothing more than this like walking body that every mm. man wants to jump at and be mm. intimate with. And it's like, okay, but there's more to women than that. There's mm, yes. <laughs> like so much more. And these women don't even see their value or the preciousness and who God made them to be. And to me, that's 
just yes. so disheartening. <laughs> and that's what I love about working with women yeah. at our clinic <laughs> is just really trying to help them see how God made them valuable and he made them precious and that there's more to them than yes. just <laughs> being an object. For <laughs> yeah. Men. And definitely, yeah, I use the right word there, object, because it seems to me that abortion is what turns women and men, as we talked about hookup culture, like, oh, no, hookup culture is going out the window here. Well, hookup culture is what objectifies people, turns them into something to get used and disposed of. You know, mm -hmm. the whole idea of having the right to hook up and leave that has got to destroy people, especially women. Ultimately, that would lead to depression because what you think is power is just getting, you know, a bunch of men who don't care about you as a person to um, just use you for something. Okay, you, you get a free meal, he gets his free relationship, and then you part ways, and then, you know, what did you get out of that? He's gone, he doesn't care if you live or die, you know, like, that's objectification. You're not a human in his eyes, you know, you're just a thing. And that's what we really hope that these pro-abortion women can understand <laughs> about pro-life. We value people. We value lifelong commitments, loving, committed relationships, <laughs> pregnancy that's planned not by abortion, but by a loving bond of marriage and pregnancy when people are indeed ready for it. You know, we recognize that, you know, unfortunately a lot of situations happen now where people aren't ready for pregnancy and stuff, and that's what these pregnancy resource centers are for, for support and help and counseling and stuff like that. But, yeah, <laughs> to the pro-abortion women who are hashtag abstinence on social media like you're starting to get a little bit of what we're hoping for in the first place just it's the right thing but not the right sentiment <laughs> so i think it's interesting how you mentioned a couple of times now about pregnancy being planned hmm. because <laughs> when i was in midwifery school one of the very first questions we would ask each pregnant mom would be, was this a planned pregnancy or an unplanned pregnancy? And if they say unplanned, mm. then the next question would be, oh, well, would you like some information on an abortion? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. okay. That's always the answer for an unplanned pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, at what point do you trust God with your family and pregnancy? Because, I mean, you can do like different things to, say, avoid pregnancy, for example. But sometimes that doesn't work and you end up getting pregnant and then that's considered an unplanned pregnancy. But you're not going to just go out and have an abortion because of that. Like, to me, it's like unplanned or planned is just like yeah. not the right terms. Yeah. It could be sure. like Cause married surprised people, yeah. or unexpected oh, yeah, or sure. maybe even better would be a blessing. Because uh, yeah. that's what God calls them. God calls children a blessing and a heritage. Mm -hmm. Like he does yeah. not say, oh, good for you. That was a planned pregnancy <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, whoops, that was unplanned. Like. That just from the very beginning takes away the value of this life that is inside the mom. Like, to me, it just seems like, <laughs> I don't know, I get nitpicky about some uh, of the oh, stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> I'm like, all right, when can we just start saying that it's a blessing and not be so critical about when or how you get pregnant, you know, within marriage like that? And hmm. yeah. Sorry, my little soapbox. <laughs> well, thank you for that, sweetheart, because, yeah, that is how pro-life people view pregnancy. It's not a punish women, control women thing. It's, as the Bible describes it, a blessing. Children are a heritage. And we mentioned in another episode about how a barren womb was considered a curse, you know, on the woman or on the, on the nation. One of the curses in the Deuteronomy chapter 29, I believe, was that the wombs would be bare. And like that was one of the most dreadful things. Mm. <laughs> but how times have changed so that now 
an unplanned pregnancy is the worst possible thing that happens and that's because of hookup culture which is made possible by things like abortion as birth control but yes we want you pro-abortion women to understand what the pro-life position is and i'm going to look at another quick statement by uh, an opinion letter on helenair.com this is quote with all the issues surrounding Roe versus Wade, I can't help but notice one seemingly crucial issue that's missing. The responsibilities of the father, father in all caps. If life begins at conception, the responsibilities of both partners should also begin then, unquote. So this is another statement where the idea that pro-life people parentheses men <laughs> um, don't believe that there should be any responsibilities for the father because there's this misunderstanding of pro-life meaning another side of hookup culture where pregnancy is a tool to control women but that's not the case because we're pro-life here we know most people who are in pro-life who would consider themselves pro-life would say Amen. <laughs> yes, we need to reclaim, we need to recognize that the responsibility of a pregnancy falls on both parents. <laughs> Not just the mother, but the father, yes. And um, it mentions, legislate for men to have financial responsibility for the mother's health as she heals and that the male partner has at least equal financial responsibility for the child's upbringing from conception through age 18, then we may have a different perspective. Now is the time for men to step up to the plate, unquote. And I say, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that is pro life. We believe in family. We believe that men, especially, now it says at least equal. Normally, when it comes to financial responsibility, you know, as we're talking about maternity, the wife might not be able to work as much or at all, you know, taking care of the child, more responsibility should fall on the father. Financial responsibility, that is part of God's design in biology for the way things work there and God's design according to the Bible where he says that if a man care not for his own he's worse than an infidel so it is it should be the responsibility of the father of a child to care for his wife when she's pregnant through pregnancy, yes, up till the child is 18, when the child grows up and becomes independent, both of them are fully invested, taking care of their children, and the father should be willing to work hard, earn the money, and um, be it not just working and earning money, but intimately involved in rearing the child. <laughs> Now, <laughs> am I sounding like a fanatic? Am I from another planet here? <laughs> no, that sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that might be news to this lady here writing this article here because it seems like she doesn't understand pro-life because once the idea of Roe versus Wade affecting culture, causing ramifications here, now it's it's like an epiphany here, like, wait a minute, what about the men's responsibility? And we're here on the sidelines saying, yeah, we've been trying to say that. They're continuing in their epiphany. Men should be involved then. If we can't kill the child, then the men have their part in this. They can't just abandon the women. They have to take care of them. They have to take care of the child. There's a lot of financial responsibility that's going to befall the men, right? You know, this has to happen, right? And we're like, yeah, that's what we've been trying to say, and that has been lost because of abortions. Because abortions enable men to abandon women. <laughs> it's not the pro-lifers who want men to abandon women and leave them pregnant. It's the pro-abortion men who want to uh, use abortion as a means to abandon women. Like, I know, sweetheart, you probably encountered the situations and I know we have a book by Abby Johnson, The Walls Are Talking. It mentions several cases of workers in abortion clinics that, you know, changed their minds, but 
yeah, there are cases, there are many cases where you have that boyfriend who threatens to leave if his girlfriend doesn't get an abortion. So it doesn't seem like abortion is something that's empowering women. It empowers the men. It's a tool for men to control women. Abortion is not pregnancy. <laughs> and that's what that's some of what we are trying to say here. Abortion abuses women. It doesn't empower them. It empowers selfish men. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it can help women be selfish too, but I think it empowers selfish men even more. You know, you have the mm-hmm. cases of abusive stepfathers and so on who bring the abused girl into the abortion clinic for an abortion to cover up the crime scene there and so that it's enabling more abuse and so on. The boyfriends who abandon the girlfriends if they don't get abortions because these men don't want to provide, but we as pro-lifers say no relationships are sacred you commit uh, you plan it out and you provide (laughs) so sweetheart you have something to say about the recent executive order trying to ensure that there's something for pro-abortion people to fall on after the dobbs decision (laughs) Uh, (laughs) yes so this past friday um july 8th So just two weeks after Roe v. Wade decision was overturned, then President Biden talked about his executive order to ensure that women can still have access to abortion, and he will make sure that there's a team of lawyers to defend them if they get penalized for having abortions in states that there are restrictions for that. Um, making sure that the male in abortion pills are easily accessible. And yes, he was basically calling the Supreme Court people like out of control for making this ruling. And he needs to step in and actually bring back like an important basic human right. And yeah, just very disheartening. But I mean, we're not surprised. And this just is another example that we can never say that our work is done in fighting for life because there is such, such evilness Mm. against these innocent little babies. And I mean, it just takes prayer. It takes people and willingness to stand up for these little guys that have no voice and for these women too, like we've been talking about. So yeah, just something to pray about these next few weeks here as we see how this unfolds more. Yes, definitely sweetheart. So we encourage listeners to pray for how states handle this executive order. I know it doesn't have the force of law. You know, it's not law. That there be no misunderstandings, that God will protect precious life especially also the pregnancy centers and churches. God's hand will be on that, protect them from evil people and their violence and vandalism against them. Yeah, just pray and especially also pray for the opportunities that all this misunderstanding opens up because it seems like, you know, as the Dobbs decision, it's not perfect. I mean, it's a constitutional issue there, but it's not perfect. It doesn't get rid of abortion. But as we've seen from the fallout here and the misunderstanding, the TikTok uh, complaints here, a lot of pro-abortion people, especially pro-abortion women, don't understand what the message that we're trying to say. And we think it opens up wonderful opportunities to explain and help them to understand, no, that's not what we mean. We agree with abstinence, abstinence, you know, until marriage and mutual love, um, commitment. We agree with the idea that fathers should be responsible for rearing children and for life. And that's what the Bible talks about, talks about love and commitment. And I think that if you realize the value of this, you know, realize how what you think is a woman's right, what you think helps make you equal is 
really what's eating you from the inside, destroying you, you know, destroying your moral conscience, destroying men, also making men abusive. And God uh, has designed things. God has designed relationships for the purpose of love and commitment. And we see, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 2, Now concerning the things which he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, referring to being single there. But And then verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So there's this idea that if you're not married, you don't touch each other. What's meant there is relationship. So it's good for someone to remain celibate and single, but if they want to get married, they get a wife. You know, you have a husband and wife relationship. And verse 9, he says, referring to someone who's trying to live celibate, he says, if they cannot contain, let them marry. So that's the idea there. If you need that uh, intimacy, then you marry. That's what it's intended for. And so we really think that that is what you would desire. You you really want something like that. You know, pro-abortionists who've misunderstood the message that we're trying to proclaim, that really is what you need. That's really what you want on the inside. You've just been so duped by hookup culture and abortion culture to understand what true love really is, (laughs) what commitment, the value of commitment, because pro-abortion women You want a man who loves you and cares about you and would care about the children that you would have together and would stick around and provide for you, be willing to lay down his life for you and your children. And that's what God has designed and that's what pro-life position is all about. And so, yes, we as pro-lifers have a lot of conversations coming up ahead about this as we see. And so, speaking to fellow Christians, fellow pro-lifers here, we see that there's, uh, we just looked at a lot of misunderstanding here. So, I want to give you 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Where the apostle says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. These are the fleshly lusts that abortion culture promotes, hookup culture promotes, and they war against the soul. Having your conversation or your conduct honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, They may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So that's what we're trying to be for these people. Let our conduct, let our message show that they're wrong. They refer to us as evildoers. They're going to accuse us of wanting to control women, being misogynistic, being haters, but that's not what we are. And if we speak clearly, we demonstrate love and commitment contrary to how they're accusing us. We can help them to glorify God in the day of his visitation. And so verse 15, it kind of demonstrates how these people who misunderstand, how they're kind of revealed. It says, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. (laughs) And so, yeah, I think these verses are very helpful to explain what we're up against, the battles we face, and don't lose heart because we have the truth And as this Dobbs decision is revealing, it's revealing that there's been a lot of pent up misunderstanding. And, you know, I admit I've had to learn that people actually think this way about pro-lifers that, you know, (laughs) and they're thinking that abstinence is an argument against pro-lifers, that the idea that fathers should be committed to taking care of the woman and the child is an argument against pro-lifers. So let's Uh, help them to understand that this is the arguments we've been trying to make all along and put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. (laughs) Thank you for being such a great pro-life husband and (laughs) 
mm-hmm. like just how you love and care for me and for our children and you are definitely a great example of what it means to I don't know. <laughs> even what the words i should say (laughs) you're just so awesome and we're just yeah so blessed to have you oh i'm (laughs) definitely blessed to be married to you sweetheart and to have a loving sweet wife and mother who cares about our children who's committed and yes and you know what we want to say is that's what god's plan is for you (laughs) to not abortion not hookup culture, not fatherlessness and so on, all that kind of thing, but a committed marriage and especially the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's really what we want to point you to because that's the ultimate expression of love, how Jesus lived a perfect sinless life and died on the cross demonstrating sacrifice, you know, ultimate love, something that we didn't deserve and yet he still did that for us and, you know, how much the family relationship, as much as we could try to be as fallen people and sinners, dimly to reflect the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated and taught. And so (laughs) we um, hope and pray that this episode was a help. And if you're a a pro-abortion person who stumbled on this episode, we hope that this was really uh, informative, enlightening, and that you'll continue to research further, look into what we've been trying to say and (laughs) the value of pro-life and the message of the Bible and the gospel. And stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso and God bless. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.